So now that we know some of the fundamentals of how a tower works, let's talk about the different types of towers. Different types of towers can serve um, different applications in a, a little bit of a better way. Uh, so there's different categories that towers kind of typically fall in. Uh, the first, um, it's kind of a manufacturing type. There's factory assembled products, we call them FAP towers, and then there's field directed products, um, FEP towers. We're gonna stick on the factory assembled side for the most part. Um, because the, the field directed, you're going to see those more on large, large manufacturing processes um, or power plants for the most part. Um, so on an HVAC side, you look at the, the factory assembled. Um, so the other type is the draft type. So there's cross flow and or there's induced draft and forced draft towers. And then there's also the air to water contact type, which is cross flow and counter flow. So let's dive into that cross flow and counter flow and induced draft versus force draft. Um, so this is a cross flow tower. You know that's cross flow, pretty simple. Water's coming into the tower, it's going down over the fill or the heat transfer media and then air is coming in. So the air to water interaction, they cross each other. Um, so that's how you know if it's a cross flow tower. And then it's an induced draft. So you have a fan at the top pulling air through, inducing air through that tower. So it's an induced draft cross flow tower. So some of the advantages of a cross flow tower, um, one of the biggest ones is its maintenance, maintenance uh, ability, to main, you, ability to do maintenance on the tower. Um, so what it allows you to do, it's a little bit of a larger tower. Um, so you have a big plenum walkway, you have ladders that you can get up to the top. Um, there's all sorts of different uh, mechanical accesses to be able to maintenance uh, the mechanical side of it. Um, also, you're gonna have a much better ability to clean it um, just from access to the fill, access to uh, the basins, hot water and cold water. Uh, from a, a freezing standpoint or operating in cold weather, uh, you're able to operate it at a a better way that will help you facilitate not freezing up your tower. Um, whenever you're able to reduce the flow in a controlled way, uh, it'll help it maintain its operation in cold weather. Um, now, when I say it's a, lar a, a larger footprint, typically that's gonna be under 750 tons um, compared to a counterflow tower, which I'll talk about next. Um, but once you get above that, typically it'll be a smaller footprint. Um, it'll vary a little bit, but right around that 750 tons is where that will switch over. Also, it's a little bit of a lower pump head than our counter flows, uh, and that's because it's a gravity flow distribution system. So you're gonna pump the water up into the two hot water basins here, and as long as you keep four to five inches of water above those nozzles, you're gonna get the right head pressure in those nozzles and a good water distribution uh, over the fill. Um, so you're gonna have slightly less pump head there. Um, and then with this design, it'll allow you to reduce the, the flow rate down to about 33% of your design flow, um, which becomes a real big benefit when you get into variable flow that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and you're able to do it in a controlled way that will perform well. Talking about the uh, induced draft counterflow towers. So induced draft again, air is getting pulled through by the fan and then water is coming in, going down over the fill or heat transfer media and air is coming up. So the air and water are counter to each other. So that's how, a, how they came up with the counter flow uh, naming system. So some of the benefits, pros and cons. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of this, it was designed to kind of fit into a small space. So if you're up on top of a roof, not a lot of room, um, it's able to, to fit. It has four air inlets, an air inlet on all sides. Uh, and you're able to, typically under 750 tons, it'll be a smaller footprint than the cross flow tower. Um, so take one cell, place it kind of in a, in a corner on a building um, and get the cooling you need. But because it was designed to be compact, tiny and fit into a small space, it's not as easy to access a lot of the maintenance um, parts of the tower. So you have your mechanicals up here. It's a little bit of a smaller access door to get to. Uh, you're gonna have to, you know, climb up a ladder, uh, and whenever you're looking at the, the collection basin here at the bottom, you know, if the water's actually going, it's just gonna be splashing up, hard to see what's going on. So really good for tight spaces, not as easy to do maintenance on. 
Um, also, another big distinguisher uh, is it's a pressurized distribution system. Um, so water pumps into the header and then the water will actually spray out of the nozzles and it'll have a much larger throw of that water. Um, and because it's pressurized, you're not able to reduce the flow going through that tower as much because you'll start to get water channeling. And I'll show you that a little bit later as well. So Stephen, we have a question. Um, is the cross flow the same principle as the counter flow heat exchanger versus the parallel flow? So is it the same principle as far as the... Yep, same principle. Uh, it's just the air versus water orientation. So the whole, whole principle is to try and get as much air to water interaction to get that evaporation and get, that's where you get your cooling from. Um, so they each kind of have their place where they fit well. Um, from a, Again, from a maintenance standpoint, uh, the crossflow outshines by far. Um, but if you need something in kind of a tighter spot, that counterflow can fit very well. There's two other questions. So going back a little bit, uh, how far or how often is customer budget dictating design? For example, the budget will only allow for a tower that can provide required water temperature 80% of the year. All right. Is it, uh, I guess I can't ask questions back. So if it's an HVAC design um, and it's the hottest part of the year that they don't need that cooling, that can significantly reduce the size of the tower that you would need. Um, and thus your upfront cost. Um, if it is a manufacturing kind of application where it's that same heat load in the winter time, and they might just need to turn it on or turn it off and still reject that same amount of heat, uh, then that, that won't, it won't really reduce your overall tower size because um, it's gonna have to still reject that heat. And again, in the winter time, if you have to reject that same amount of heat load, um, it's more difficult to cool in the wintertime. So you might actually, the wintertime design might actually drive the size of your tower up in that kind of application. So on an HVAC system, if it's in summertime where you don't need that, uh, that same amount of cooling, it can significantly reduce the amount of uh, tower you'll need. And then lastly, the, the approach graph that you had up there, mm -hmm. it says, is this approach graph based on experience? based on experience. Um, so, I mean, the cooling tower, cooling towers have kind of been in, in existence for a little over a hundred years uh, in one, one form or fashion. So there is a lot of experience behind it, um, but a lot of testing as well. Uh, there's development centers that go along with it. And then the, a, a lot of just people out in the world. So yeah, I would say a lot of experience and a lot of very intelligent minds that have tested it and and seen that it is indeed the case and indeed true. Uh, appreciate the questions, keep them coming. So another type of tower, uh, it's our force draft counterflow tower. Um, so the force draft, instead of having a fan at the top inducing air through the tower, it actually has a blower fan in the bottom and it pushes air through the tower, it forces air through the tower. Still counterflow because the water is going down, air is going up. Um, this kind of has a real specific uh, application that it works well in. Um, so this is actually a tower that can be put inside a building and ducted. Uh, and the benefit of it being a, uh, a force draft tower is blower fans are able to overcome a larger amount of static. Um, so if you are trying to duct it, you're able to move the, um, move the air through that tower uh, with a blower fan much better than if you had an axial fan. Typically though, what you'll see is the horsepower goes way up. So you're almost two times the horsepower that you might see on an induced draft tower. Um, so it, it's, it's one of those things that uh, if you, you need it, it's great, you can have it. Uh, but uh, from an energy standpoint, it's, it's not gonna be what you want. Um, but there are some other benefits, lower noise, lower profile, uh, but typically you're gonna see it's on a smaller application. So this is another one. This is our induced draft fluid cooler. Um, so typically on the other towers we've talked about, you know, if you're using a chiller, uh, what you might see is you might have these towers and then they would run and hit a heat exchanger. And then from that heat exchanger, then it would go on to your chiller just to try and keep the water going into your chiller clean. 
uh, a lot easier to clean a plate and frame heat exchanger than it is a chiller. Now, say that you have a heat pump situation, might be a university, um, nursing home, hospital, hotel, a fluid cooler would be a good option to use there. Because um, what a fluid cooler does is it takes your um, process fluid and it actually puts them through coils that are internal to the tower. So it's kind of like combining your plate and frame heat exchanger and an open tower into one. Um, so from a, an application standpoint, like I said, heat pumps is where you might see it the most. Um, this particular one, it just has a coil in it and it doesn't have uh, fill in it or heat transfer media. Um, and what that does is, so you can run your water over it during the summertime, whenever you're getting those peak heat loads. Uh, but then in the wintertime, you have the option of not running water over it and just running your fan and running it dry. And you'll be able to get a decent amount of cooling running it dry just because there's so much coil in there. So there's a lot of um, advantages and disadvantages with it. One, it's going to be pretty expensive up front and going to be very heavy, so you have to pl plan for that. Um, but if you do really want some of that dry cooling in the wintertime, this kind of gives you the best of both worlds. Now, if you want to be a little bit more efficient and not just an open tower but not, and not just a fluid cooler, this is kind of a hybrid. So it actually has heat transfer media in the tower as well as the coil. And so what it does is it recirculates, cools the water over the heat transfer media, and then goes over the coil, which has your process fluid in it. So it indirectly cool, cools your process fluid in that coil. Uh, there's quite a few different coil types. You can do galvanized, which is typically the cheapest. Something to kind of keep in mind with that, though, on the inside of that coil, it's still just raw steel. So you don't want to drain that coil whenever you're not in operation because it's raw steel, and if air gets in there, it'll start to corrode, and you'll get little pinhole leaks. Um, another option that you can do is stainless steel. You can drain that. Um, very durable, but it's not as uh, efficient. And, and so... There's other options out there also for copper coils. Copper coils are good. You can drain those in the winter time. Heat transfer of copper is very good, so it's much more efficient. Um, and if you're getting into, you know, kind of the life cycle cost and recycling, um, you can recycle a, a large copper coil, you know, 15 or 25, 30 years down the road, um, probably for more than what you bought the, the fluid cooler for. Um, but knowing if you need to drain that coil uh, is important because on a, on a galvanized coil, you don't want to drain those.